Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Debbie Gotel. <laughs> Debbie is uh, a commissioner for Hennepin County in Minnesota. Welcome to the podcast, Debbie. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yes, me too. I'm really story. First of all, for our listeners who are in all different parts of the world, in all different, some in 
who work in government, uh, but many who are educators or in corporate. Tell us a little bit about um, Hennepin County. Here's your chance, <laughs> but also about what uh, what you do as uh, one of the commissioners of uh, Hennepin County, Debbie. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, Hennepin County is kind of in the central north of North America and the United States. So a lot of people are probably familiar with Minneapolis, St. Paul. We're more on the Minneapolis side. And we, we seven commissioners all have districts here. And so we divide that up into pieces kind of things. In fact, we just went through redistricting. So that, that's kind of the gist of the county. We're in one of the largest counties in, in the country. Um, we're large by the size, the population, and our budget. And so there's, there's a lot to factor in about that. And there are large counties that do a lot more than what I would call smaller counties can do. They have to rely more on state do an awful lot of services that are usually reserved for the state and the state passes through dollars so that we can do more. So that's kind of the gist of the county and the county government is a step above the city governments. So the city governments are a municipal government. The county is a municipal government, but we, we have a square footage area that's um, larger and encompasses many cities around the whole metro area that were here. So that's kind of the jurisdictional piece of it. As a county commissioner for a large county, besides doing the things smaller counties would also do, which is we, we develop you know, and put together um, road programs for county roads, and we help cities with some of their programming there. But what we do in addition is we deliver social services of all kinds to all types of people. For us in Hennepin, since we're a larger county, we have a county jail and we have a county hospital and we have county clinics. And so that's specific to our, our county, not all counties, many counties can't afford to do those kinds of things, but we're, we're kind of the catch-all um, hospital for those who are uninsured or are vastly underinsured. And so we take care of a lot of those folks there. But I mean, this, the programming runs a gamut. We do everything from making affordable housing um, to um, you know, fixing roads and bridges to helping put in transit. We are actually putting in a big light rail project right now that goes through what is considered part of my district right now. And so these are literally trains and tracks and stuff like this that we, we are assisting in the funding with on, on that level. But because we're a large county, we're able to do those kinds of things. So we do rental assistance for people. We do emergency help for people. We have 24-7 SWAT team for mental health. So if somebody has a crisis, we can be out at their location, usually within two hours to help with the situation. So we do mental health as well as physical health. We have free dental clinics. Um, so the gamut of the health care is definitely something under our um, umbrella of services that we have besides the, the roads and transit and trains, then the jail system. But with the, with the system, we also look at our formerly incarcerated and we have a great deal of programming around that. So when they transition back into community that they have a better chance of having a successful transition. So that's kind of some of the, mm. some of the big programs. We do a lot of small stuff. We're, we're working on a program though from internal care. I, I'm sure people know that the U.S. does not fare well compared to our other Western countries in maternal health. And at Hennepin County, we're really trying to do something about that. I think around the world, we've seen gun violence escalate, especially we have here in the United States because guns are so readily available. We are certainly looking at how we circumvent violence and stop that. Um, about half of our homicides are, aren't true homicides, are actually suicides. People who die by guns, half of them, that were recorded in Hennepin County were suicides, not somebody else shooting someone. So there's there's a lot of ills in the social system here. Mm. And, you know, those are the things we're just, we have to step up to the plate and tackle. Through the, through the pandemic, 
I think there was some of, some of the most creative and innovative ways of delivering services, even for people to qualify by taking pictures of things on their phones and sending in so that they could get their applications processed rather than coming into offices. And we took a lot of those dollars and made sure people could pay their mortgages or their rents, people could pay their back utilities. And we literally delivered food to people's homes so that they mm. had food. Um, I think one of the biggest things that have been left since the wake of the pandemic, and we, although we do see another wave coming, we don't think it'll be as bad as the other waves, Hmm. Um, is is the fact of getting people back to work and yeah. the women who have been left out of the workforce, mostly because there isn't childcare. The child cares are closed and many didn't reopen and they hmm. don't have childcare and they can't afford it then when they do get it. Well, well it's, it's um heavy. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's very heavy. It's the most important. Um, yeah, that's what I love when uh, I, I didn't really know that, to tell you the truth, until chatting with some some other um, county commissioners. Debbie, I didn't really understand what you do as a, you know, in a county and, and as a county commissioner. And, and I think it's um, it's amazing because you are tackling like, uh, yeah, basically every big societal challenge and issue <laughs> you sort of listed them off there and and it's um it's amazing uh, that we have people like you in in that space so let's jump into your story i'm really excited to hear you journey. let's start with your uh childhood growing up you debbie from that season of your life that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today Boy, I'm just, tr I'm trying to think about what helped me, but there are several things probably. One of the things is, is actually we moved around quite a bit when I was younger and, and my sister didn't fare as well in that. And I fared very well in that. I, I learned how to adapt and make new friends and be resilient in that. And I think those kinds of things in life are just what they are, right? In, in, that's when jobs were moving around, started moving around a bit. My, my dad um, worked for Goodyear Aerospace. And when that program closed down, you know, he had to go find more work. And so we moved, we moved first from Missouri to um, Ohio and then from Ohio to Illinois. And so we never went back home, which would have been Missouri. And so we, we went into Illinois and that's, that's kind of a, a really different place to be. And I think I, at that age, my mother was volunteering a lot. My dad was volunteering a lot. He ran Boy Scouts. Mother did some with Girl Scouts. She volunteered at the school. You know, she did work in the library. And I kind of got a sense of what it meant to be part of a community bigger than yourself because of my parents. And I think that was a really good thing for them to instill in us as kids because all of us kids have now given back to the community as you know, we have grown up, but they set such a great example by doing those kinds of things for us. So I think growing up with parents who kind of do those things and, sh and they were leading by just doing. So I saw action, it wasn't verbiage, it was mm. true action. And mm. I think, you know, that, that speaks to integrity, you know? So I, I yeah. think that's, that's just a good way. It was a solid, solid way to, to see things in action and to know that that's what you're supposed to do as an adult. Do you remember, are, are there any stories from, uh, you know, any stories of your parents that really stand out from your childhood around their, I guess, their service of others, the community that, um, that pop into your mind about how they sort of made a sacrifice or something they would do when they surprised you with how they any, any stories come to mind? Wow, now you're asking some really big, bold questions to go back in my memories and everything like that. <laughs> you know, but but I do remember, because I remember going out and helping dad at the Boy Scout camp once. And I remember, because he had a very large troop of, of boys, and I think he had some junior scout masters and some other parents helping, but he had... I, I recollect it was over 300 boys and they had a huge winter camp out, a huge winter camp out. And I remember that there was a young boy there um, who, who was not 
not doing well and the camping out and, and my dad went to go check on him and everything specifically just him out of all that many boys went out to t- check on him and he realized that he didn't have the right shoes didn't have the right socks didn't have all these things so of course he called my mom and that's when we went out there and um, we brought stuff so that that young kid and i don't know if his parents couldn't afford it or why did nobody ask questions like that we just did because that young man needed that help you know and so i i specifically remember that too and i i also remember even after us kids were older and everything my dad volunteered and worked for junior achievement he so believed that these young people needed more leadership skills uh, and so junior achievement of course is where you 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 have them do projects where they have to um, try to sell their own product or make something or try to, to invent something new or something like this. And he worked with these young people, you know, many of them high school students um, affiliated where he worked through other parents and everything and worked really hard and spent nights, you know, away from us going to some of their presentations and helping them find what they needed to be successful at their projects and everything. But, you know, I, I always saw that kind of thing in, in my dad. It's yeah, that's um, helpful. And uh, I, I love how you you made the point that it wasn't just verbiage; it wasn't just things that your parents said. It was what they modelled, and you were going along, and you actually watched. And and you and your siblings, the proof is in the pudding because now you've grown up, and those same values are um, obviously were caught, you know, by um, by by you and your siblings. Mm-hmm. Most certainly. Yeah. Do you remember, Debbie, one of your first real leadership opportunities when you might have been when you were little, it might have been in a team environment um, of some sort, it might have been when you were older, you know, um, where you just remember, oh, yeah, that was my first time I really had a bunch of people reporting to me, or you were really responsible for a project and, and, and felt like you were carrying, you know, that casting vision for it. What, what comes to mind? It, high school comes to mind. Mm. A high school story, if you want to stay in the childhood part of this. Yeah, one go for it. Things, <laughs> one of the things is, is that we were all getting disgusted because what would happen at the lunchroom is they would, they would just take the leftovers and like throw them all together in a casserole and the food would just taste awful. You know, it'd be good the first and second day and then they'd take all these other things and throw them in. It was like they didn't care what they fed us, right, and that we were supposed to eat it. And so a lot of us started just to start talking among ourselves. And um, I remember working on this and we worked on a boycott and we stopped buying the lunches. We started either bringing our lunches or, or bringing something for somebody else or something. So they didn't have to buy the lunches. You know, even if their parents gave money, and didn't want to pack it. Well, I'll bring you something. Right. We just stopped buying it. And so they had to throw all that food out. And so finally they realized that we weren't going to just eat any, anything and they they started to change things up so that's that's one of my first recollections <laughs> uh, uh of uh kind of being a troublemaker i guess i was known a little bit as, as a troublemaker doing things yeah. like that yeah that's courageous and um but it's uh and you know jumping to a philosophical question from there because i just wondered is and I'm interested in your in your thoughts on this. How do you, you know, how do you balance or how do you approach knowing when to um, make a make a, a like really disrupt if you disagree with something or you think the wrong thing's happening versus obeying what's what sort of uh, you're told to do? That's something that's always been a real tension for me. I look at things and I go, oh, okay. That's, you know, back then that was completely fine that they, that they went against me to, to stand up against something. But um, years later and, and working in with all of your experience, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, yes, I think I've crossed that line in the wrong place many times. And I think that's a real learning experience hmm. um, and not, not knowing how to do it correctly, right? And I think that's anybody green into the field who wants to do something, is passionate about something and not knowing where to start or how to start. 
and uh, yeah, many times getting myself into trouble. But you know, so that's that's what happens to you when you're young, and when you don't know. And when I got older and more savvy, and I I learned how to really get together with that. I, I learned how to gather people around me more. And and I did some of them when I was young, but I didn't always follow that same step. There's definitely steps that you follow. First of all, you need to gather enough people around and see if you can find it. Sometimes mm. though. If you think other people feel the way, you gotta help. You gotta be bold enough to say it out loud because they're maybe timid to say it, right? Mm, mm-hmm. So, so there's a part of being bold and seeing who bites, and then mm. trying to grow those people around you. The vast majority of people, lots of times, I I know as a public official now agree with me, but they don't tell me that. But if I call them and ask, they will. And so it's not always the loud voices that are the, are the voices that I think are the majority, but, and so you have to find those voices so that you can gather them together and where they might reside and you bounce ideas off of people before you move something forward. Yeah. I love that. Be bold enough to, um, to, to say it and see what the response. Yeah, I, I I love uh, your answer to that question. Thank you. So as you've as you progressed in your career, who are some of the people in your career so far, Debbie, who have had the biggest influence on your leadership? Some mentors oh. along the way. Uh, tell us about some of those people. I had one very specific mentor that was is just a jewel and still in my life today, and her name is Edwina Garcia. She was the first Latino to the legislature here in the state of Minnesota. Um, and she represented Richfield, where I live, on the city I live. And she's just a tremendous lady. When I was in the activist world, before I became a public servant, I'm still an activist on the side. Um, she was, I used to have her pulled out of the legislature, and that's how I got to know her. And, and I was a bit of a pain for her, but she knew me, and we would go have coffee now and then. And... Um, I was working on one of those issues that I had gathered a lot of people around and the current mayor would not respond to phone calls, would not return my phone calls because he knew what I wanted to talk about and he didn't agree with me. And, you know, I I don't care if people disagree with me. I talk to people who disagree with me all the time, but some people, and that's a very Minnesota kind of thing. It's, it's kind of that Minnesota nice, which really isn't nice. They just avoid you if they don't want to talk about something that's uncomfortable. Um, I don't avoid those kinds of things, but, and so I just got mad and I, and I kept trying to get a couple of the other council members who just weren't giving me quite the time of day, but I, I had a lot of organized, um, mostly people of faith around here, around this housing issue. And, um, I finally got mad enough. I said, all right, I'm done with this. I can do a better job than that mayor. I can at least return somebody's phone call. So I called up Edwina and I told Edwina I said, Edwina, I'm going to run for office. Oh, she said, let's go have coffee. So we went and had coffee. And I said, she says, oh, so you're going to run for school board of council? I said, oh, no, I'm going to run for mayor. She says, you are kidding, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. And I said, guess who's going to run my campaign? (laughs) I had to ask her every day for a week. Edwina, you have to run this. I'm so green. I'll lose if I don't have you. You have to do it. Have to do it so and she did she did eventually I begged her so long she finally gave in (laughs) to me and she ran my camp and we're best friends we've been friends for nearly 20 years now wow and and to be best friends on the other side of doing something like that where I imagine it's intense and you're really in each other's pockets doing something like a campaign to maintain that friendship means yes yes there is but she's advised me she's my go-to person hmm you know, and, and there are several matriarchs around this town um, that, that get together from time to time, but she's pretty special to me. There's, there's others that, uh, there's other people who have s- since passed. Uh, Gertrude mm. Ulrich was another very impressive woman who served on the council. She ran for county commissioner and didn't win. Mm. Um, some, some years, many, many decades ago, she's since passed, but she was the one who prepped me for my debates down in her basement. I remember <laughs> she had a beautiful basement that overlooked the woods and everything. And she would sit there for hours on an end and she would tell me wrong answer, wrong answer, Debbie. <laughs> nope. Nope. Try that one again. Come on. No, that's not going to work. You can't say it that way. You know? So oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes. 
expertise is is, uh, is priceless. Uh, are there any stories of you mentioned? Um, uh, you know the the multiple uh, women that that really inspire your advisor that you said you know as you mentioned any stories in particular that come to mind that are appropriate uh to share that um just stand out for you because of how one of uh one of them really handled a situation or advice they moment or watch them navigate something in their life or, or go through a crisis any stories come to mind i'm trying to i'm trying to think of of things like that um, you know, I think one of the things, yes, there are, and it's, and it's, it's another story about Edwina and it's not my story, but watching her, I watched her cause she was a representative for many years and she ran for secretary of state and she was a very strong candidate and there was a whole lot going on and, and we're Democrats, we're on the democratic side. So we're progressives and they were playing all kinds of things and she didn't get the endorsement and she went on as an independent. And she stood, still did pretty well, but she didn't win the election. But what she taught me is how, how to walk away from that with grace, right? Because losing an election is really hard. It's a really difficult thing because you've got to raise here in the States. They don't give you money. You have to raise the money yourself from private donations from res, from people. And there's donation limits and everything. So it's, it's a difficult task to do that. And it's hours of grueling work, war, literally just walking from door to door, door knocking folks and talking to them. And in the evenings, you call them up on the phone and spend your evenings calling and talking to people nights and weekends. It's, it takes over your life for, you know, a whole season and to watch her do that. And then she'd never lost a race to watch that happen, you know, and watch her go through that. And then how, how well she carried herself. She's truly a professional and a lady with grace. That's when, that's when the rubber hits the road and it really, uh, you really, how people react up sport as well it's easy to it's easy to be a great um uh winner but i always you know some of the moments that that have meant the most to me watching some of my sporting heroes you know say in tennis like rafael nadal and roger federer lose and they still act with such grace that that has had a big impact on me and i think that's where it really shows someone's character yes it does and and those are the life lessons you need because we're all going to fail at something mm. and how you pick yourself up and move on that matters. Yeah, I agree. So think of your career now, Debbie, can you think of any aha moments that you've experienced aha moments where the penny really dropped for you about a particular leadership lesson that's always stuck with you or like we just discussed a, a mistake or a failure where you, you know, you learn. Uh, I can think of many in my life where you uh, you drop the ball in some way and you go, I will never forget that lesson because I experienced it. Or you had a big win with a team and and uh, achieved something you didn't expect. Any any aha moments in your career? There's been several in my career, but I think early in my career, I was first a mayor before I was a, a county commissioner. I was mayor for 10 years in the town I live in still, Richfield. And I remember running for an election, running for the election. And I, I, um, I didn't know until four in the morning after the election that I'd even won. And it was kind of one of those things where we were just in an economic surge. This is 2004. Everything's just going gangbusters and great. And we're talking about redevelopment and how we're going to do these things. I had, you know, some plans and everything. I've been talking to um, residents. It was exciting time. And of course I, you know, I ran in 2004 and took office later in that, the end of the year. And then in 2006, the economy, just the bottom dropped out, totally dropped out. And if that wasn't an eye opener, you know, Richfield was one of the worst hit areas in the Midwest with foreclosures and um, what I would call probably illegal mortgages from, you know, bogus mortgages to people who lost their homes, a lot of immigrant people. And 
it was a really tough time. It, it was really hard because all the dreams that I had for Richfield, all the dreams that I had with the residents and everything were totally turned upside down. Now I had to go from, you know, these great dreams to survival mode for the city. And, you know, you never know what's inside you until something like this happens. Right. And to have to lay off people at work and stuff. And I, I, um, I, Asked for my, I asked for him to take no salary, the years of that downturn and everything, just because I wanted to keep some of the people um, at the city employed, rather, you know, because I, I was fine on my own, because mayors are not full-time positions, they're stipend, and I thought my salary can go right back into the city and at least keep somebody part-time on the payrolls. And it was so hard to watch these people tearfully, knowing that they were, you know, their families were going to be in jeopardy. And I remember mm -hmm. being out walking that summer, door knocking and talking to a, uh, an older couple who was in retire, close to retirement age, who'd lost their home, their only home, and were moving and they didn't even know where they were going. Um, it was tremendous pain. Mm. We were fortunate from the federal government to get um, millions of dollars put back into Richfield to try to salvage some of that. And we did some of those, but you know, there was never, a lot of these mortgage companies were never prosecuted for what they did, those bogus loans they did. And I know this happened around the, around the world at the same time, but walking through that and living through that and having to make those tough decisions and do that, um, you know, was a really, really tough time in my life and tough time mm. being a public servant, watching what happened to people's lives, how they fell apart. Yeah, I can only imagine um, because, uh, you know, I always think of this when, when, when there's a, when, you know, when we make a leadership mistake and it means people who are working for us lose their jobs or, you know, sometimes that's easier, at least you you can own it and it's and it's horrible but i think when something happens that's completely out of anyone's well well no like you said like there are people who are at fault but there's nothing you could have done and yet you're now having to react to these circumstances um like a lot of people in different industries with covid completely out of their hands and they had to make really difficult decisions i think that's that must take an incredible on you because there's no um I don't know. There's no softening the the blow. It's just a it's just a truly horrible thing you have to be best of, and, and it must be very hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel when you're in the middle of of having to lead a process like that. Well, it's your neighbors. You know these people, right? Mm, mm -hmm. You know most, especially in a small town like Richfield. You know, and and so it it's it, yes, it hits very close to home, and you know how badly it, it hurts people. So. Yeah, it was devastating. I don't, I, I have to tell you that, you know, I didn't, through that period of time, I didn't sleep a lot of nights very well. And I have to tell you through the pandemic, it wasn't any different. I would wake up at two o'clock in the morning, worrying about things and be up having a cup of tea, um, <laughs> just thinking about what could else could I be doing? Yes. And about, you know, for, for leaders who might be listening, who, um, they've been they've been lucky so far in terms of the different roles they've had where they haven't lead through a truly uh difficult context like like what you're describing where it's really devastating but you have to keep getting yourself up every day to try to make the best outcomes work for people and to balance budgets and you know things still have to be done what did you learn about how to lead in a situation like that after going through that a couple of times I think a couple of things I learned is to really challenge my staff back and say, can't we find a better way? Can't we find a more creative way so we don't have to make this cut? Or, or what else could we be doing that's different? How much of this could we do without fu more funding? You know, and people, you know, when you challenge people to become more creative, that works. That really works to do that. But I don't just rely on my staff. I go to other, you know, I, I was on the National League of Cities. And so I would go to their conferences and I would be looking for ideas for specific problems. And I would be talking to some of my other colleagues, you know, from across the country. What are you doing to solve this problem? 
one of the things that was so innovative and we're working towards as much as we can is getting mental health into our jail systems. We don't have mental health in our jail systems. Some jail systems actually have wards, a whole floor dedicated just to mental health for the prisoners who are there. And I think that is wonderful because most of these people um, have issues that they need to talk to someone. And if not, if you're incarcerated for a long period of time, you're most likely going to develop some issues from just being incarcerated because it's trauma. And so, you know, I look for ideas outside of where I'm at to do that, but I also ask my staff to do that. And I don't necessarily say you can't go to conferences and go do things because we're tied on money because they need to make their connections to talk to, to their colleagues in other parts of the country so mm. they can come up with better ideas. We have to collaborate. We have to depend on each other. It's the only way we march through this in a much better way. Yeah, I, I, I love how you push your team to be creative. My favorite questions around this, which um, isn't so much in a crisis, but I, I love the I love the idea that there's always a third option. There's always another way. Like there's usually two options we're looking at, and there there must be a third option to find an, another way. Um, and uh, you know, so a couple of questions I love. I think it's Peter Thiel um, who coined this idea of saying getting someone to say okay, or, or even a business to say what's your ten year goal. And once they've mapped it out, say, and, and how could you get there in six months? And I love that uncomfortable, almost ridiculous question. Another one that I heard recently is, um, which is from a, a great book called Profit First, that that's um, really helpful for uh, particularly entrepreneurs, small businesses who are trying to scale through a ceiling, is to say, how could we get the but um, with a third of the spending? just love questions like that and i love how you mentioned try, you know really pushing your team to get creative because unless we ask questions like that and push our teams to think creatively times we won't come up with something that's uh, that's incredible but it's that one time in 10 where someone uh, suggests something that's a game changer and really does unlock um new possibilities that that's uh, remarkable so I, I love that sort of thing well, and I think staff have to know that as public servants, how far and how creative will we be? What will we try? What will we start talking about? You know, what, what would we do? How far would we push the envelope? And once they get to a comfort level, they might think about bringing different ideas that they hadn't thought to bring to us before. So mm. you need to be trusted among your staff. Yes and have good relationships with them. Absolutely. Uh, let's, as we, as we sort of wrap up, Debbie, I've got a few Leadership Express questions for you. Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> okay. The first one is, what's a book that you've gifted a lot to other people or a lot? Um, right now I'm looking at healthcare. I'm, I'm really big into the equity of healthcare, but I'm, I'm really big on the upstream. And we're having a big discussion about that um, behind closed doors at the county. And I can talk about it because we've talked enough about it personally. Um, and it, the one book I, I really like is How Not to Die by Michael um, Greger, MD. And it talks about how to reverse disease. You know, what really causes the diseases of the 20th century. Mm. And we have a healthcare system that is just bleeding dollars. Yeah. Um, our hospital and our clinics, and we have the sickest people. Well, how do we get ahead of that and reverse that? So I'm, again, looking creative. I'm way far ahead of stopping it rather than starting it. You know, back, you know, in the early 1900s, people didn't have a lot of diabetes. We didn't have a lot of irritable bowel syndrome. We didn't, you know, we didn't have a lot of these things, but our diet was different. We were out working more physically. There was a lot of things that were very different. Our food has been adulterated in ways that are probably not the best for us. And we don't eat the best foods for ourselves. And, and that's quite frankly, what a lot of it is. It's really that simple, but actually it's that hard. It's that hard to get people to change their ways and the advertisers and everything else, the, the marketing media is against us about where you really need to be to keep your health and how to reverse it. And um, it's really hard to change old ways. 
um, actually your country, Australia, and mm. the UK are two of the leaders, I would say, in this field, because a standard of care has changed for your two countries for type 2 diabetes. It is now mm. um, a low-carb, high-fat diet, which is not the standard of care through most of the country, and certainly not through my country yeah. and through the world. And so um, you're innovators in that way because you're really looking at a wellness piece where we're looking at treating the symptoms. And we haven't made it over to the other side of the wellness piece. And this is a big issue for me, mm. um, for our own employees and what our insurance covers, because they don't cover enough wellness and, mm. and upstream stuff to, to um, you know, our healthcare system where we um, serve, serve people uh, who are residents of Hennepin. And many pe people who come to HCMC, our hospital, and our clinics are outside of our, our county. Wonderful. I think a lot of leaders are going to be making a note of that book, How Not to Die. I love that. And, and I think anyone, uh, I'm, I'm certainly fascinated by any anything we can do, regardless of our um, what role we're in to move forward towards that wellness is, yeah, it's just, it, it is heartbreaking, unnecessary, um, yeah, just unnecessary illness that could that could be prevented. But the shift, like you said, is I think we underestimate how much is involved in really shifting that. It's going to take a lot of vision. It's going to take a lot of communication and a lot of um, storytelling. Possible. So I love that. That's that's something you're so passionate about. Uh, next so question. I always, I don't, well, let's just let me finish up with one yeah. comment on that. Yeah, I go for get it. Told, well, you know, you got to pay for that. I said, where we where do we pay for it really? Do we pay for it on this end or do we pay for it because somebody lands in the hospital? How much difference is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's cheaper Love to it. prevent. Yeah, it is cheaper to prevent. Wonderful. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Do you have any favorite questions you ask, Debbie, when you're with stakeholders, when you're doing an interview to hire someone, you're working with your team? Are there any questions that you'd love to ask people? Well, first of all, I really want to find out why they applied to this job specifically. And that's because, you know, in my office where we work in the Hennepin County, we are doing all kinds of things around, you know, policy, but it's very local and everything. And usually when I ask that questions, I find out that there's usually some policy pieces that they're passionate about. And it matters because I'm always looking at policy pieces and higher level kinds of things. So I, I always ask them what, what drove them to particularly come to look at this particular job in an office as a government official. Because a lot of people, you know, you're not a lawyer, you're not a doctor, you're not working in a big Fortune 500 firm. Nope. And it's pretty, and when you're staff, you're pretty low key. Um, but I was, uh, you know, and I'm really surprised how people answer that question and what drives them. But it's always, almost always a policy piece. Mm, that's so interesting. Love it. Um, okay. Last question. Let's uh, just to land it because I'm, I'm looking at the clock and this has been so much fun. Um, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Lead with integrity. Don't ever compromise your integrity for anything. Mm. You'll never get it back if you do. That's the most, one of the most important qualities yeah. of any leader. Wonderful. Wonderful thought to, to land on. Uh, well, for people who've really enjoyed hearing some of your story, Debbie, where can people find out more about um, you in terms of uh, wondering if you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, but also about Hennepin um, County? Well, yes. And so you can just Google Hennepin County and you'll see the five districts and you can find my name, Debbie Gotell, as you scroll down and all my colleagues. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, and yes, I'm on LinkedIn as well. I probably don't do as much on LinkedIn as I do on Twitter and Facebook. And mostly it's about some of the, the things that I do. And actually, if you sign up electronically, I do a newsletter so you can find out the little municipality of yeah. where I govern, you know, through District Five, which is three three cities here, um, you could you could actually look at what's going on in that district because that's what I talk about in that newsletter. Wonderful. Well, I think um, I, I always think of the listener who's jogging or um, 
on the track, you know, on a train and they're just thinking, wow, Debbie, the way Debbie leads, this is the sort of person I'd love to just follow a bit more. And so, yeah, that's a great idea to follow that newsletter. And because I think so much of leadership is communication and um, it's about modeling, like you mentioned from the start about your parents. And, and if we can get around and read the communication of leaders who we want to be like, that's a really great practice. So that's a, that's a great idea. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. What a fun episode and really great stories, getting Debbie to really think back to, <laughs> to childhood yes. and, and high school, and but just wonderful, rich stories um, from, uh, from Debbie's uh, leadership journey so far. Uh, don't forget, for our listeners, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, two other places you can go to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish by saying a massive thank you to Debbie for being so generous with your time and for sharing wonderful stories. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Very wonderful. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership, and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org, right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders 
this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.